It's a very modern idea. I'm reminded of a mother who told her daughter, honey, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. And her daughter was visually excited, to, visibly excited to hear this. And her mom said, well, what, honey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And her, the daughter said, a zebra. Let's be clear, you can't be anything you want to be when you grow up. There are limits. It's a fact of life. There are external limits, and there are internal limits. And one of the external limits is time. There are only so many hours in a day, and only so many days in a life. And we live in an era and in a culture that tells us to rebel against limits. And yet, it's our limits that make us who we are. If everybody can be anything, then there's nothing truly unique about any of us. If we're all just blank slates that can become whatever we want then there's nothing distinct about anyone. But we know it's not true. Even in families that have identical twins who are born on the same day, at the same time, under the same horoscope, and grow up in the same household, can have two totally different personalities and ways of being and capacities in life. Anyone who has a child or who's around children knows that they come into the world with something. And in that mix, there are some things that limit what they can do and some things that make them uniquely qualified to do what they do or to become what they become. Not everyone's going to grow up to be Steve Jobs or Michael Jordan, or Albert Einstein, or Beyonce. Michael Mead says this idea that we can be anything we want to be sounds like freedom. But really it's a kind of confusion. As if we're nothing to begin with. There's a deep anguish and an emptiness in it. He says, we don't enter the world empty but aimed in a direction, gifted. We come in marked, styled in a certain way. Our task is not so much to find out what we want to do as if it's a our life path is a matter of desire like picking a flavor of ice cream, 
but rather, what am I meant to do, considering who I am and the times I live in? It's less about desire and more about discovering our unique relationship with life in each period of our lives. He goes further to say that the struggles that we encounter are not there to defeat us. Rather, if we allow them, they can push us into discovery, into self-revelation that allows us to find out who we are and what we're capable of. In the aftermaths of the shootings in Las Vegas this past Sunday, I began thinking about the 20,000 people who witnessed what happened and the more than 500 who were wounded. What kind of impact will this have on them and on their lives? I came across the story of Rebecca Gregory and her son Noah, eight-year-old son, who both were injured in the Boston Marathon bombings back four years ago. After 17 surgeries to try to save her leg, Rebecca had to have her leg amputated. Noah and his mother have since raised money to buy gifts for children who are in hospitals over Christmas. Also, they raised money for earthquake victims in Nepal a few years ago. But their main passion is an organization that they started called Rebecca's Angels. It's a foundation that raises money for children suffering with PTSD. Little Noah was sitting at her feet near the finish line when the two bombs exploded. Had he been standing, she suspects that he would have been killed. His mother served as a human shield. But while his physical injuries were minor, like her, he has emotional scars. Not only did he witness the bloody mayhem, But he watched as his mother struggled to recover. Rebecca Gregory is determined to make sure that the two brothers who set off those bombs lose in the end. She said, over time, their names and their acts of terrorism will be forgotten, but the survivors and what we do to make the world better, we will be what is remembered as the overwhelming impact of those events. And that has fueled her to do what she's doing. I hope that in time, that the people who are hurt and affected by the events of this past week will be inspired by people like Rebecca and Noah, her son, and will find ways to turn their wounds into some gifts for their own lives and for our world. Now, my topic today is time. I never thought I'd hear Pink Floyd played in the church, but here it was. They did a great job, too. Fantastic. Thank you all. Beautiful. That was arranged by Rick Fortner, our music director. I don't think he ever expected to be arranging a Pink Floyd song. So time, you know, it's one of our great limits, right? So my larger topic is limits. Every life faces them, and we can either let them stifle us or propel us forward. Often it's in our limitations and in our constraints that we find our greatest opportunities. Instead of rebelling against life's limits, we might start to see them as doorways into our sense of purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I really wanted to be a rock star. There was only one problem. I couldn't sing and couldn't seem to learn how to play an instrument. (laughs) So then I thought, well, being a professional athlete would be a nice second possibility, but there was the problem that I wasn't very talented at sports either. So like most of us through the course of growing up, I began to become more realistic about what I could do and what brings me alive. So after a number of jobs and different life experiences, I discovered ministry was what I loved. And people tell me sometimes, oh, I could never do what you do. You know, like Barbara Prose rushing off in the morning to be with someone who's just lost a loved one. People, you know, a lot of people say, God, it's the last job I'd want. And yet, it's some, I can't imagine doing anything else for me. 
But to take a more recent example than uh, my years of, of uh, growing up wanting to be a, a rock star, nine years ago, I was, uh, Anitra and I were wanting to have another child. And it turned out that we couldn't have another child biologically ourselves. We tried. We tried for quite a while. And um, we actually at one point got pregnant and had a miscarriage after 10 weeks. It was really painful. Anyone who's been through that knows how difficult that is. But it was a clear limit. We were not going to be able to have a child, not biologically. And we had to face it. And so we did, but we wanted to have another child, so we decided to adopt. And we were blessed with our daughter, Lila, who you may know. She's, she's pretty amazing. At least I think so, as her dad. But I don't know if you know much about adoption these days, how, how adoption works, but it's different than it used to be. Adoption today, the if you want to adopt, you put together a packet, you tell all about your family and and your philosophy of parenting and all kinds of things and pictures of your house. And, and then it's all up to the, the birth mother or birth couple about who they want to give the child to. And, and for those of us on this side of adoption, we take whatever child is given to us. So they also ask if you have any restrictions of, of children that, you know, what, what do you want for a child? You let folks know because once a parent chooses you, the obligation is that you accept that child that, that you're given. And so we, you know, we were just excited. We had uh, you know, a wonderful home, and we wanted to add another child. We had a lot of love in our hearts, so we put our name in, and we were quickly matched with a birth mom and blessed with this daughter, Lila, who many of you know is African-American. And so almost overnight, I've, we found ourselves, these two pasty white 40-year-old parents with this, raising this African-American girl in a time when race has become a major issue in American society. I was having to learn how to braid hair and, and do twists and make really straight parts, which I'm, I've gotten pretty good at. But she also came into our lives shortly after I found myself ministering to a congregation that includes more and more multiracial families and more and more families of color. And so it's an example of how a limit all of a sudden became a doorway into a a higher purpose and possibility. Every closed door, every disappointment, every hardship can help point us towards what or who we're meant to be in any given moment of our lives. If you've ever had your heart broken with a breakup, it's, you know, it can be excruciating initially, but then in time, we can realize that ultimately it helped us to discover who we are who we, and who we need to be with. Or getting turned down for a job, or not getting into a school or a program, or you know, not making the team. Right? I wish I had a dollar for every person who's told me a story of, you know, flunking out of medical school or out of pilot training or some other career path that they were determined and felt like it it had to be what they were going to do only to discover afterward their own bliss in doing something totally different. So let's circle back to this idea of time. It's a big limiting factor. There's only so much of it, and our lives are bound by it. So some people, of course, are working three jobs, and all they do is you know, sleep and get up, work, eat, go to sleep, work up, get up, work again, and barely have any time to do much. Like the wheels on the bus, the hands on the clock just keep on going round and round. But for the rest of us who are able to do more than just work and eat and sleep, We have choices every day about what we're going to do with our time. So I wonder, do I I go exercise? Do I return an email or a text? Should I go visit my child's sports practice? My neighbor is having surgery. Should I bring a meal? I just received an email asking me to sign a petition. Should I go click over and do that? Or another one asking me to give a donation to an important cause? Maybe I should take 
a moment to write my senator about something that's going to destroy the human race or the earth. I also have some bills sitting on the counter that need to be paid or a pile of mail to go through. I should probably write a few thank you notes. I could also use time to catch up on a few things at work, fix that lamp that broke last month, trim a few trees. But sometimes I just want to watch television and go on Facebook and see what my friends from different parts of my life are doing. Or I'd rather go to the lake or go to the park than come to church. A few people decided that this morning, I can tell. <laughs> but, you know, no matter what, you know, my kids need me, my wife needs me, my job needs me, and oh yeah, my parents, they need me too sometimes. So we can find ourselves wondering, even worrying, what should I be doing with my time? How much time do I have? And am I doing the right things with the time that I have? So, and then random events like what happened in Las Vegas or the recent hurricanes or the threat of nuclear war add to the anxiety about time and our own mortality. We can start to act habitually either out of fear that our time's running out or fear that we won't get everything done we can become addicted to doing. We're either doing because we think it'll get us what we want or because it helps us avoid what we fear. The point is that it's easy to fall into compulsive doing. It's also easy to be doing one thing but thinking about all the other things that I need to be doing so that we're not even really present with the things that we are in the midst of. Zen teacher less uh, Kaye says, if our mind is somewhere else, it means we're trying to be someone else, not who we are in the present moment. It's easy to be distracted. I mean, life demands so much of us, things that we want for ourselves, that we want for our families, that we want for our world. Now, in biblical times, we read that God appeared in a pillar of smoke by day and fire by night to lead the people. They knew where they were supposed to go and when they were supposed to go there. If God wasn't telling the Israelites what to do and where to go directly, then it was coming through a, a miracle or an angel or through some prophet who was speaking at the top of his or her lungs. But in our lives today, it's not always so clear what we're supposed to do with our time. If we look at the religious leaders of the past, we could see Moses and Jesus and people like that. Both of them spent time in the mountains, away from everything, away from their life, away from their world, contemplative, quiet. The Buddha spent years first running around trying everything that he could find to try to get to enlightenment. And then finally, he decided to just sit still and be quiet. And that's when he discovered his life's purpose. Gandhi took one day off a week no matter what was going on, for contemplation and silence to make sure that he was on the right track. He listened to figure out what he was supposed to be doing. Martin Luther King Jr. said he prayed for one hour every week, unless he was really busy, in which case he prayed for two hours. <laughs> what I've come to realize is that slowing down and pausing is not about not accomplishing things. It's really about living with a certain quality of clarity and presence. The old saying is, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will lead you there. If you don't know who you are, then everyone else's agendas will become your priority. And then, in the words of Pink Floyd, one day you'll find ten years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. Then the sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath, and one day closer to death. We need to give ourselves time to just be. I was listening to insight meditation teacher Tara Brock. She has a podcast that I listen to sometimes. And she recalled the story of the award-winning 
violinist, Joshua Bell, who spent 45 minutes playing six of the most exquisite Bach pieces in the Washington Metro Station on a violin that's worth something like a million dollars. People had paid hundreds of dollars just days before to see him in concert. But this time, nobody stopped. 45 minutes. The Washington Post did an experiment. They just watched him, and he was playing his heart out, except for a couple of little kids who stopped, but then their moms, you know, pulled them along. Come on, don't stop. The question that Brock asked us in our daily lives, do we perceive beauty and stop to perceive it and appreciate it? Because there's beauty shining through every moment all the time, but do you stop to notice it? How can you stop more? to appreciate and connect with the beauty of life in each moment. How might you take the time to pause and reconnect to the center of your being each day? It's about cultivating a quality of open-heartedness and presence so that you're more fully aware and embodied in whatever you're doing. It's about expanding the quality of time that we have because we can't expand the quantity of time that we have. If you want to make the most of this precious time, then we, can be, we have to begin to shine the light on our habits of compulsive doing. It's about learning to rest into what's already here around us, wherever we are. It's, it's so easy to get into a pattern of feeling, I'm not doing enough. I should be doing more. There's loose ends that I need to tie up. No matter how much we act, There's always going to be more things than we can do. So our best hope is to be present with the things that we are doing in every moment and to take time to pay attention to who we are and what direction we are uniquely aimed. If you think you could be doing anything, not only are you wrong, but you're missing what makes you special in this life. We can either join a culture that tells us that limits are bad or that freedom is a life without limits or we can realize that our limits are real and in fact a doorway into our destiny. If you don't have a meditation practice or some, something that you do to quiet yourself, some time in your day that you put aside just to get in touch, to, to listen to your own heart, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, We've got, uh, Nicole Ogandari is teaching a class on Wednesday nights here about contemplative practices. If you don't have one, you might consider that. Um, Our soulful circle groups here at at the church that just are just getting started up again this fall are a wonderful way to be with some other people to talk and share and listen and get to know some other people as you practice. But remember, this life, like your body, is a thing that you have to leave eventually. You know that because you've seen others do it, others who were once like you, living inside their piles of bone and flesh, smiling at you, loving you, leaning in the doorway, talking to you for hours. And then, one day, you'll wake to find 10 years have got behind you, and you're older, shorter of breath, and one day closer to death. Amen. visiting with us online today. We love connecting with people all across the country and around the world sharing our powerful message of love beyond belief. There's something new happening here. You can now join All Souls as a virtual member. Our virtual membership is designed for friends who live outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma and who want to engage with All Souls in a meaningful way. You can be part of an expanding family, a global family really, wherever you are. If you live in Oklahoma, Ohio, 
or Orange County, California, Canada, or Cameroon. By becoming a virtual member, you'll be able to deepen your connections with members and friends here in Tulsa and with members wherever you are. Each week, you'll receive special All Souls content tailored for you, our virtual members. Virtual members have access to pastoral care, to personal prayers, and also receive invitations to exclusive web events. You can learn more, and if you're ready, you can become a virtual member today by visiting allsoulschurch.org forward slash virtual membership. We're grateful our ministries are having a positive impact on your life, and we want to share the good news of Love Beyond Belief with more and more people. So no matter what, we need your support to keep this ministry growing and thriving. So please consider making a gift today. You can do so by texting Love BB for Love Beyond Belief to 73256 or simply visit our website. You are a blessing in our lives. May you be blessed. And be a blessing.